Hello, I'm Athene Laws, a PhD student here at the Faculty of Economics, Cambridge, and I'm delighted to be here today with the 2019-2020 Sir Richard Stone lecturer, Professor Janet Curry. Professor Curry is the Henry Putnam Professor of Economics and Public Affairs at Princeton University and Director of Princeton's Centre for Health and Wellbeing. She also co-directs the Programme on Families and Children at the National Bureau of Economic Research and is President of the American Society of Health Economics. Professor Curry's research investigates a broad range of government programs, including food stamps, social housing, education and healthcare, and their effect on childhood and later life outcomes. Professor Curry, thank you so much for being here today with us. It's lovely to be here, thank you. Uh, so your Richard, Sir Richard Stone lecture is called Child Health and Human Capital. Uh, would you be able to start by just briefly summarizing what the lecture is about? So the lecture is, as the title suggests, about the importance of child health for human development and how having a healthy start in life is associated with a lot better outcomes in terms of employment, education, earnings, uh, and so on. Great. Uh, so part of your talk um, spoke to the, the nature versus nurture debate. Um, uh, what do your findings uh, say about that, that issue? So my findings suggest that that's really not a very useful way to think about things because usually any outcome that we care about is the result of both nature and nurture. Somebody could have a predisposition, but it usually takes some kind of environmental trigger to make that thing happen. And so really we need to pay a lot more t attention to interactions between nature and nurture and not, not ask the same old question, which is, is it nature or is it nurture? It's both. Sure. So yeah, we often get stuck in the dichotomy and it's, as you said, it's flawed. It's all about the interactions. Great. Um, there was also quite a strong focus on mental health during your talk, um, particularly mental health is one aspect of human capital. Um, it's becoming an increasing area of research and policy debate. Um, so what would you say sort of the, the main takeaways about mental health and human capital are? So one of the important takeaways is that when you talk about health or how important it is to treat health problems, most people think first about physical health problems. But in terms of things that cause a lot of disability and suffering, mental health is really more important quantitatively in terms of the number of people who are affected and how severely they're affected, especially when we look at working age people and what causes people to lose a lot of working time or to be less productive at work. It's largely mental health issues. So it's just something that we need to pay a lot more attention to. Um, so in the theme of paying more attention to it, what do you see would be the sort of the main questions that we still need to answer from a health economics point of view um, with regards to mental health? So some of the work that I've done is just trying to look at, well, what are the long-term consequences of children having mental health issues? And uh, so I've done some work suggesting that those long-term consequences can be quite negative trying to put them into context by comparing them to some common physical health conditions and showing that uh, mental health conditions often have larger negative effects. I think one of the frontiers areas to look at is the effectiveness or cost effectiveness of, of different kinds of treatments for mental health because in uh, more so than for a lot of physical health problems. With physical health problems, we kind of know what to do. We have some guidelines. We know what good treatment is. We know what bad treatment is. For mental health, there's a huge variation in the types of treatment that people have been getting and very little evidence about long-term effects of those treatments. So your talk was very focused on um, health economics, but a lot of your other research looks more broadly at the impacts of poverty on childhood and later life outcomes. Um, so just starting with a broad question, um, what would you, what are the sort of the main headline findings about growing up poor and, it, and its impacts on your life outcomes? So how big of a, how big of a problem is this? Well, it's a big problem. Uh, the, the debate in the past has been in terms of whether families that are poor 
have other issues that are the things that are really causing the negative outcomes. So everybody agrees that if you grow up in a poor family, you have worse chances in life than if you grow up in a rich family. Although, of course, there's always success stories of people who escape poverty and, and so on. Um, but the, this controversy about whether it's really causal is important because if it is causal, then you know, giving people money works. And if it isn't causal, if there's something else going on, then maybe giving people money isn't going to work. So in terms of sort of basic policy of how we should treat po poverty, it's really a very important question. Fantastic. Uh, that sort of flows into one of my other questions as well. So economists often favour direct cash transfers as a way of targeting need. Um, so giving poor families money, as you said. Uh, how do you see that trade-off between taking that approach versus in-kind provisions like social housing and food stamps? Yeah, so I used to be fairly negative about cash transfers, but I've become more of a convert uh, just because I think there is quite a bit of evidence that cash transfers can be very useful to many families in terms of uh, raising them from poverty and improving their children's outcomes. I think there's still a place for um, other types of safety net programs because not every family is fully functional and able to deal well with a cash transfer. So you still want to have things like uh, maybe subsidized childcare, school meals, um, in some places subsidized housing to you know make sure that children have the basics that they need even if the family is not kind of fully functional. So a combination of the two you would say is the yes. right approach. Great. Uh, so one of the programs in particular that you're well known for researching is the Head Start program in the US. Do you mind just sort of briefly outlining this, uh, what the program is involved and, and what its impacts were on children? Yes, so Head Start is a well, it started as a preschool program for three to five-year-old children. Uh, at the beginning, it was a part-day program, and it was set up with a lot of requirements in terms of training for the staff and different kinds of requirements about the physical space, the type of programming, that uh, the children should receive nutritious meals while they were there, that they should get uh, help accessing medical care, they should get screenings for things like dental. Um, and so it, it was conceived as a fairly high-touch, high-quality program. It was rolled out across the country. It's changed in various ways. So now that there's the, a lot more full-day programs and there's also more infant programs for, for one- and two-year-olds as well as three- to five-year-olds, the Evidence suggests that the program has a positive effect on children. It um, doesn't solve all their problems in the sense it doesn't bring the average child in Head Start does not uh, have the same outcomes as the average child, but it closes about a third of the gap, which is a pretty large effect. Uh, so I think we knew from previous research that model uh, preschool programs that were really well run and, and also very expensive had positive long-term effects, but there was less evidence that uh, a real public program, large scale, rolled out across lots of different communities could have a positive effect, and I think my research was helpful in showing that that was the case. Great. And I suppose yeah, one of the particularly important aspects is, is the long-term the long -term effects. It's, hard, it's harder to justify a program if we can only measure short-term effects. Um, unfortunately, it's very hard to measure long-term effects. So how do you see sort of, how much do you think the advent of lots of longitudinal data will help with this kind of analysis and program analysis um, to, to try and understand these long-term effects better? Yes. Well, the um, access to data is huge, and administrative data, as you say, has been incredibly helpful in trying to facilitate these types of long-run evaluations. The Head Start example is very interesting because I would say the short-term evaluations were quite misleading in that 
what you typically see is that when a child goes to one of these preschool programs, their test scores are higher for a few years, and then their test scores are the same as the rest of the children. So a lot of people observed that and said, well, there's a positive effect, it's short term, then it fades out. And so a lot of people thought that this was not a very effective thing. But in all of these programs, there's a kind of peculiar thing where if you follow the kids for a long time, then you see, oh, but wait, they're more likely to finish school, they're more likely to go to college, they're less likely to get into trouble of various sorts. So it, it does seem like it had a longer term effect, but not working through test scores, working through uh, some other mechanism. Sure, so it's important to look at a range of outcomes when you're evaluating. So we've talked a bit about education and health. Uh, one of the other areas that you're known for working on is, is social housing and, and government housing. Um, what would you say the main costs and benefits to children of, of public housing are and how effective is it as a social policy tool? Uh, so social housing is a really tricky issue, um, partly because the way it works out so often involves kind of winners and then people who don't get anything. It's usually rationed. So uh, for people who get it, it's a very big income subsidy. And then for people who don't get it, they, they get no subsidy. Um, so in the US, social housing programs have moved from being uh, programs where the government builds the housing and people live there, which resulted often in large public housing projects, which had their own mm -hmm. problems, to voucher programs. Um, the voucher programs have their own problems Notably, a lot of landlords don't want to accept vouchers, and it can be very difficult for people to actually use vouchers. But um, in principle, it does allow you to kind of spread the money around more so that more families can be helped. Um, and when families are given assistance to find better housing, uh, and especially better housing in better neighborhoods, that has been shown to have long-term effects, particularly if the children move when they're young. Um, so there's been quite a move uh, in the UK and other countries as well towards um, subsidies rather than provision. I suppose that's the in-kind versus cash transfers. Uh, I suppose one of the debates is about how much that then just feeds through into higher rents rather than, what, what would be your take on, on that? So there were actually a couple of uh, large-scale housing voucher experiments in the US which did not find effects on rents. They, they did find some effects on supply, which were kind of interesting. It wasn't so much new housing being built as old housing being brought up to the standards so that the housing vouchers could be applied to those units. So uh, I would say the, the experiments are a little bit old, and it could be that in some markets that are really tight, that it could have an effect on price, but there's, um, in a lot of markets, more elastic supply than you would think in terms of things that could be brought into the market if there was a uh, reason to do so. Oh, that's really interesting. Uh, so some of the other work you've also done, covering a lot of bases here, uh, is environmental work. Uh, I'd say quite sobering. Uh, a lot of your research is looking at uh, childhood and even fetal exposure to pollution. Um, what are the main main outcomes you find there? So as you say, it's pretty sobering because I would say uh, in a nutshell that I've been looking at effects of pollution. Normally I'm looking at pollution levels that are below the current regulatory thresholds, often way below, and I'm still finding negative effects. Uh, so that's one finding. Another finding, also pretty sobering, is that there are big inequalities in who gets exposed to environmental pollution and who doesn't. Um, wealthier people and more educated people tend to move away from known pollution hazards, leaving poorer people to deal with them. Uh, so I think it could be uh, an important source of 
inequality and also intergenerational transmission of inequality. And I have to ask this question, uh, how do you go about convincing an environment skeptic of the value in actually acting on this? Well, uh, hopefully information helps. I, I recently wrote a review article because it's the 50th anniversary of the Clean Air Acts in the United States, which is a very um, massive piece of legislation that was instrumental in cleaning up the air. And a really striking thing, looking at 50 years of economic analysis of this particular set of policies, is that economists have always gotten it wrong, in the sense we've always overestimated the cost of complying with environmental regulation, very systematically. Uh, and I think one reason for that is because when you create an incentive uh, to do so, you get technological change in the direction of making it cheaper to comply. So things like you say everybody has to put a scrubber in their factory chimney, all of a sudden there's big changes in scrubber technology that make it way cheaper to do that. You create a market and then uh, manufacturers come into it. So that's one aspect. Uh, but then on the benefits side, we have these thresholds that we use which turn out pretty much to be systematically wrong. So we find out that the benefit of cleaning up the air was much greater than we thought it was. So the cost is much less, the benefit is much greater, and we're just systematically wrong over 50 years. So I think we should learn uh, from past mistakes and, and perhaps uh, you know, adjust our criteria. Do you think the uh, political economy argument comes into this at all as to why we're systematically um, yeah, over over exaggerating the costs and underreporting the benefit. Is it is there some lobbying involved, or is it is it more benign? Well, there certainly is lobbying involved, and there is organized lobbying from from some sectors. You know, oil and gas has its own research institute that um, argues about things like fracking and what the advantages and disadvantages of that are. But I I also think that economic economics tends to be kind of conservative and so perhaps it's a bias more in uh, our way of looking at things than in something that's imposed on us from the outside. So we've touched on this a, a little bit earlier. Um, one of the issues with doing empirical economic research um, is that for ethical or practical reasons we can't run experiments. Uh, particularly in this sort of social policy area here often. So we have to be a bit more creative about how we figure out whether something is actually causing an outcome or whether it's just correlated. Um, so is there a, a nice example in your area of, of people mixing up correlation and causation and what's a, a better way to actually go about unpicking the relationship? Uh, well, going back to the Head Start example, uh, a lot of critics of the program said that it was uh, not a good program because children in Head Start do worse than other children, which is certainly true. Um, in terms of the way that Head Start children are selected, the program requirements say that if there's a waiting list, you're supposed to take the most disadvantaged children off the waiting list. So even if you compared everybody who had applied to Head Start and took the people who got in compared to the people who didn't get in, you would still get bias in the sense of finding that the people who were in it were going to do worse than the people who weren't in it. Um, so you know, coming up with a research design to try and deal with that, and in my work I mostly use sibling comparisons, other people have tried using discontinuities around income cutoffs. Um, other people have used things like expansion of the program into areas that it didn't exist in before or the initial rollout of the program. Uh, so all of those designs try and get around the selection and do find positive effects. So it's about finding a suitable control that is a bit more directly comparable than just saying those who get it and those who don't. Yes, exactly. Great. Um, so. Kind of more broadly, a lot of your research and others finds that the return to early childhood interventions are really high, um, both in terms of increased life outcomes, earning, taxable income in the future. Um, and yet we often see quite an underinvestment from the public side in early childhood. So I'm thinking in particular um, a, a small amount of public provision of early childhood education versus education in other age groups. 
Why do you think we have that discrepancy, given that the evidence is, is very strongly in favour? Mm, children don't vote. <laughs> <laughs> but three-year-olds versus eight-year-olds? Some of that is, uh, I guess, habit in the sense of we're used to having public schools, right? So we uh, spend a lot of money on eight-year-olds just through the provision of public schools, and we haven't been used to doing that for three-year-olds. Um, in some countries, it has become the habit to do that for three-year-olds. You know, so in France, you have a crash system, which is supported by the state and uh, I think is comparable to the public school system. So I, I think it takes a long time for policy to move. And I'm optimistic enough that I think that over time, things do change. And if you provide enough evidence that something is the right thing to do, that you do eventually move in that direction. Sure. So it just takes some time. It takes a long time. And uh, what would you say, um, in a nutshell, are the highest priority early childhood interventions that we should be moving towards? Uh, so th I would say the highest priority thing might be to start with pregnant women and make sure that they have the supports that they need to have a healthy childhood and uh, to follow up those infants, you know, for at least the first year or two and make sure that they have, um, yeah, everything that they need. Uh, I think home visiting programs can be really effective, both for the pregnant women and for their children, especially if they combine services that people want. If most people like to have a nurse that measures their child or does some kind of health screenings, but that nurse also then has the opportunity um, to do some education about what's normal uh, developmentally for the child and uh, what the parents can do to support their children. And those, those things can have a really uh, long-term positive effect. And just to sort of sum up, um, our invited lectures are partly about inspiring our undergraduate students. So what would your advice be to our undergraduate economic students, um, in particular those who are interested and motivated by working in social policy? Uh, I think it's great if they're interested and motivated to work on social policy. And I think the advice I would give them is don't give up, don't be discouraged, uh, keep on doing what you think is important to do. Fantastic. That's a, a lovely way to close. Um, Professor Curry, thank you so much for your time today and all of your very interesting insights. Oh, you're very welcome. Thank you.